you can have a seat. There we go. <coughs> You have your Bibles turned to Leviticus chapter 26. <coughs> Leviticus chapter 26. Come on. Shelby, when you get up there, you might just go ahead and press the pastor button. There's not an associate pastor button, so I didn't press it. <laughs> but you guys can hear me for right now. Leviticus chapter 26. So tonight we are going to finish up Leviticus. We started way back in January. We've done 19 weeks so far. This is our 20th week in Leviticus. So Leviticus, we've learned to do a lot of theology and a lot of work. And so far in Leviticus and, and studying and doing this on Wednesday night, what we've done is something I've never done before. We've used tons and tons of references, tons of scripture throughout this, just backing up scripture with scripture and just kind of layering Leviticus as we go. And uh, we've learned some wonderful things. So the purpose of doing Leviticus is not just for the sake of doing Leviticus, to learn things that are no longer apply to us anymore or to get a good history of the Bible. The reason that you study the Bible the reason you do Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Joshua and Deuteronomy is that everything points to Christ. Every single thing in the Bible is pointing to Christ. So as we study Leviticus early on and we're looking at the offerings, there's nothing inherent about the offerings and bringing the offerings that saves anyone. It is a foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to do on the cross. Every offering is a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ and his redemptive, justifying, sanctifying work on the cross. And so, weeks and weeks and weeks ago, when we first started Leviticus, we looked at two bookends of Leviticus. One is Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1, that says this, Then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, and so if you're a, somebody who underlines in your Bible that God spoke to Moses from the tent of meeting is really the first verse in the book of Leviticus, meaning that Moses could not come into the tent of meeting. He could not come into the tabernacle where God lives. So all through the book of Leviticus is about God getting us from outside the tabernacle, outside the tent of meeting, outside of his presence to bring us in. And so he's always bringing us in. He's always bringing us into his presence. So the work of Leviticus, the offerings and the festivals and the laws and knowing the character of God is all about getting us from outside the temple where God is to inside the temple. And so the very first verse of Numbers is going to say this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting. And so you go from, God speaking from the tent of meeting in the very first part of Leviticus. So you get all the laws, all the offerings, and you have all these things happening in Leviticus. And now Moses knows these things. He's applying these things. And now he gets to come in to the tent of meeting to talk with the Lord. The Lord is always drawing us in. Come closer. Come closer. And so one of the things that we've learned in this book is that blood is the price of admission. And blood is always going to be the price of admission. For, for uh, uh, Moses, it was bring this goat, bring this sheep, bring this, this calf, and spill his blood. For us, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. Which Hebrews is going to say, speaks a better word, is a better offering than the blood of rams and goats and bulls. And so, one of the things that Jesus does, more than anything, is he is our high priest. This is what he does. Spilling the blood, he is our priest. He is the one who is in the temple. And he not only is our priest, but he's making us priest. Remember when we were talking way back when in the middle of Leviticus about the ordination of the priest and the, the spectacle that it was. They were brought before the people and they were prayed over and these, these robes were put on the priest to signify uh, royalty and that they were priests and they were set apart from the other people. And then they would take blood, and they would literally cover their bodies from head to toe. They would put some blood on the earlobe, some blood on their thumb, and then some blood on their big toe, signifying that I am covered head to toe with blood. Blood has been sprinkled on me. And then we go into Hebrews, where God is explaining all this stuff in Leviticus. Hebrews 10.22 says this, 
Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with water. And so here it is who we are. Because of the blood of Christ, because our hearts have been sprinkled clean because of the blood of Christ, that we can now enter the temple. Not as, you know, people with no rights, not as uh, strangers, not as enemies of God, not even as a lay person, but you and I get to enter into the temple of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Not only do we get to enter the temple of God, we have a right to end the temple of God. We have a duty to end the temple of God. And we have a right and a duty to perform as priests among a holy nation. This is what Leviticus is showing us. Bring us from outside the temple as enemies of God, as strangers in a strange land, to inside the temple so that we can fellowship with God and perform our priestly duties. And so here at New Hope Baptist Church and many Baptist churches all across the world, we believe that you are not just lay people. We don't believe that you are just people who sit in pews. We believe that you are priests, that you are allowed to lead people to Christ. You are allowed to talk about Christ in your workplace and to carry Christ out here. It's not just the pastor and the associate pastor and the youth director who get to talk about Christ and to share their faith and to perform priestly duties, but it's the responsibility and duty of every Christian. And this is what God is showing us in Leviticus. It's a wonderful thing. So when you start looking at that, you start looking at Leviticus not as a scary book, but as a gift. Leviticus is a gift to us. And so tonight, we're not going to have a lot of scripture supporting what we're doing tonight. Tonight is wrap-up time. What is, what is the last thing, really, that God wants us to know? I mean, we've done the work. Leviticus 1 through 25, we have looked at scripture upon scripture upon scripture. And now it's, what is God going to tell us now that we've gone through Leviticus? It's been 20 weeks for us. I don't know how long it was for them when they were getting this law and reading this law. I know this. They had left Egypt. They were at the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses is getting the law. They, they haven't wandered for 40 years yet. They're just starting their wandering. They're just kind of entering into their faith where they're kind of wandering around the wilderness. And now they have God's law in their heart so that when they get to the promised land, they can begin to live under God's rule and God's control as He is the Lord who walks among them. And so what, is the, what does God want to show us in Leviticus chapter 26? What is he wanting to end with tonight? There's a lot of the word if in Leviticus chapter 26. And so I've kind of entitled this message, The Big If. Because the big if is going to be a, a big deal in all of our lives. It's something we always have to ask ourselves in our lives. That if you are following the Lord, will you do this? But if you disobey the Lord, you do this that we are making decisions all the time in our lives. Every day, you are making a decision to live with the Lord. Every uh, obstacle in your way, every time you go to Walmart, every time you go home, every time you go to your job, that you're having to say, am I going to please myself in this decision, or am I going to please the Lord in this decision? Am I going to bring pleasure to my name and glory to my name, or will I bring pleasure and glory to God's name? Will I delight myself? Or will I delight in God? Every idea we have in our head is to bring honor and glory to God, or it does not bring honor and glory to God. And we have to decide if it's going to do that or not. When a situation arises where we go to the Lord and we have to respond to someone or something, then we're always asking the question, am I going to follow God in this area, or am I going to follow the flesh in this area? And so Leviticus chapter 26 is the big if. And so let's just start in verse 1 about decisions. You shall not make for yourself idols, nor shall you set up for yourself an image of a sacred pillar, nor shall you place a figure stone in your land to bow down to it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. So let's just stop right there. We've heard this before. Remember all through Leviticus, all through really the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, the Lord has to continually remind us that don't go seek other gods. Don't go seek other saviors. Don't let your affections be stirring 
for other things. Remember my Sabbath. Remember I am the Lord your God. Do not make put any gods before me. Do not make any stones in your yard to bow down to these stones or these calves or anything else. Don't do that. And he's always having to call our attention from other things. Because in our hearts, we're chasers. We're always wanting God's stuff and not really God. And this is really the story of the whole Bible. This is the first sin, right? Adam and Eve, the sin was not that they bit the apple. The sin was they stopped delighting in the Lord. All right? This, and so all through the Bible, it's going to be looking at, I've stopped delighting in the Lord. So it's not really the apple that was sinful. It's not biting fruit that is sinful. What sinful is, I've stopped delighting in the Lord. We looked at this when we looked at Jeremiah. That they began to dig cisterns for themselves. God says, I am the spring of living water. And yet you began to dig your own cisterns, dig your own holes, and these holes don't even hold water. They're not even a good source of water. They, they leak and they're, they're no good. Yet you keep looking for other things. God, all through the Old Testament going, that you give your raisin cakes to these gods over here. You bow down to these gods over here. You make for yourself golden images and you hide your idols in your house. We're chasers. And so our tendency, and we'll look at this as next week we get into to prayer especially, is to drift toward self-reliance and not toward power and presence. And because God knows that our drift is toward self-reliance and not power and presence, that we're always having to be reminded, don't put anything for me. Delight in me. I am your supply. I am all satisfying. And I am enough. And so God's always calling their attention Israel to that, and God's always calling our attention to that because we're chasers and we're drifters. We will, while our hearts are inclined and are preset to delight in something that is not the Lord. And so every day we have to make a decision am I going to delight in the Lord or am I going to delight in myself and other things? And sometimes it's moment by moment by moment that we're deciding what am I going to delight myself in? And so here in Genesis chapter 26, starting in verse 3, God says, man, if you delight in me and you follow me, look at the blessings that will follow you. And so we get our first if in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 3. Look at that. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments so as to carry them out, then I shall give you the rains and the season so the land will yield and produce fruit trees of the field and bear their fruit. Indeed, your threshing will last until you, uh, you, your grape gathering, and the grape gathering will last to the sowing time. You will thus eat the food and to the full and live securely in your land. So it says, hey, if you follow me, I will bless the earth. I will cause it to rain. I will cause your soil to be more fertile, and your trees will grow, and your vineyards will grow, and you will eat grapes all year long if you delight in me. You will thus eat your food and live securely in the land. I shall also grant peace in the land, so that you may lie down with no, with no one making you tremble. I shall also eliminate harmful beasts from the land, and no sword will pass through your land. But you will chase your enemies, and they will fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall before the, your sword. Man, this is great news, right? If you're Israel, you're the most powerful people in the world. That five of you can defeat a hundred other people if you're delighting in the Lord. In fact, a hundred of you will defeat 10,000 people if you delight in the Lord. That nothing, if you delight in me, will cause you to tremble. It's not a pretty good deal. Delighting in the Lord and receiving the Lord's blessing. But the contingency is this. If you follow me and my statutes. So I will, verse 9, turn toward you and make you fruitful and multiply, and I will confirm my covenant with you. You will eat the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you, that's the good news, and my soul will not reject you. I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you, will, uh, you would not be their slaves. And I broke the bars of your yoke and made you walk upright. And so here's the Lord saying, hey, not only am I going to cause the ground to be more fertile and your trees to grow and to really flourish, 
Not only am I going to cause you to eat grapes all year long until harvest, till you sow again. Not only am I going to kill all the beasts of the land so they don't harm your land or your people. Not only am I going to drive your enemies from you that, that you may not tremble before them ever. That, that I'm going to be your God. I'm going to walk among you. And if you obey my statutes, remember, I brought you out of Egypt. I, I broke the bar of yoke and slavery off of you. This is how much I love you. And if you keep my statutes, and if you keep my commandments, all these blessings will fall upon you. One thing I've said over and over again, though, through the book of Leviticus is this. Israel, historically, are horrible covenant keepers. Are horrible covenant keepers. I mean, if you really read the Old Testament, and you begin to read the plight of Israel, they, they never had it easy. God is always having to hammer into their head, covenant. Always having to hammer into their head, get it right. I mean, all the prophets exist not because they're doing such a great job keeping covenant. All right, Hosea doesn't exist because Israel's going, man, you guys are doing great. We talked about Jonah for four weeks on Sunday morning. Jonah did not exist because Nineveh was getting it right. All right, that the Deborah and, and, and all the judges and Samson and Gideon and all these guys did not exist because Israel was getting it just this nailing this covenant thing. They were existed because they kept getting it wrong. And we can't sit there and judge Israel, but we as, as well are horrible covenant keepers. All right? We're always chasing other things, drifting towards self-reliance, and find ourselves delighting in things that are not of God. And so one of the last things God is going to tell Israel is this. Delight in me. There is pleasure. There is reward. In delighting in me, when I am in your supply, when I am all satisfying, and when I am enough, this is a wonderful thing. But we know Israel's history. They didn't do this. Their land was oft often overrun by locusts. They were often overrun by their enemies. And so, it's really an either-or type thing. Either you will serve me, and you will live in blessing, or you won't, and you'll live like we're fixing to read. And so there's another if statement here. Verse 14, but if you do not obey me and do not carry out these commands, if indeed you reject my statutes and if your soul abhors my ordinances so as not to carry out all my commands and so break my covenant, I will in turn do this to you. Now, I don't even want to read anymore. Okay, <laughs> That's a scary verse there. That if you don't do this, this, and this, then I'm going to do this to you. So if you keep my commands, there's blessing. But if you do not, there is great suffering. How many of you found that to be true in your own life? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Me too, right? That when I'm, when I'm obeying God, and I'm le even when I'm suffering, and I'm leaning into his, his majesty, and I'm leaning into His power, and I'm leaning into His presence, even in suffering, there's delight in the Lord. Even in suffering, there's comfort in the Lord. But man, when I get out in self-reliance and begin to do my own thing, I begin to feel it a little bit. And this is the purpose of God. This is God steering me back to where I need to be. I mean, the prodigal son had it good when he lived in his father's house and was obeying his father. Get him out for a little while. He looks like he's getting away with something, living good, but then he begins to eat with the pigs. See, we can live like that for a little bit, think we're getting away with something for a little bit, but in the end, it causes suffering. And so, how does Israel suffer? What is God going to do to Israel? And we don't know that he is going to do this Israel. We know that Israel has been horrible covenant keepers, and all of these things happen to them. So let's just read a little bit. We'll stop here and there. I don't know if I'm going to read all of it, but we'll read some of this. All right, it says, I will do this to you. I will appoint over you sudden terror, consumption, and fever that will waste away the eyes and cause the soul to pine away. Also, you will sow your seed uselessly, for your enemies will eat it up, and I will set my face against you so that you will be struck down before your enemies, and those who hate you will rule over you, and you will flee uh, when no one is pursuing. If also these things do not obey me, you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times for your sins. And so all of, all of a sudden, Gideon comes to my mind. And many of you may not read Judges and don't know the story of Gideon, but Israel was oppressed by their enemies. And Gideon is in a hole, 
threshing wheat to get enough food to eat for the day. So what you would do if you're in Israel to, to get wheat is you would dig a hole and you would get in the hole and you would thresh the wheat and you would put the wheat out and you would have food. So Gideon is, they're under occupation, Israel is. And Gideon is in a hole and he's threshing the wheat, but every once in a while he'll look up to see if there's any enemies around. All right? Then he'll get down and thresh some wheat and he'll get up and see if there are any enemies around. He'll do it. He kept doing this and doing this and doing this. Meanwhile, there's an angel sitting by the tree watching Gideon's head pop up out of the hole every now and then to see if there are any enemies uh, after Gideon. And this is, the, this is the salute that the angel gives to Gideon. Gideon, you valiant warrior. <laughs> right? You are a valiant warrior. And Gideon becomes a judge. But why is he in the hole? Because they did not keep the statutes of the Lord. Israel didn't. And he's having to hide from his enemies. And Gideon is having to be used to be a judge in Israel. I'm studying Revelation a little bit right now so that I can bring it to you pretty soon on a Wednesday night. And, and this, is, this is reminiscent, this chapter of the tribulation of Revelation. That there are seven bowls of wrath, there are seven scrolls. I mean, all of these judgments get worse and worse and worse as they come down on Israel and come down on Revelation. So it says that if you do not obey me, I will punish you seven times more for your sin. It says this, I will also break down your pride of power, and I will make your sky like iron and your earth like bronze. Your strength will be spent uselessly. For your land will not yield its produce, and the trees of the, of the land will not yield their fruit. And so I'm going to skip down to verse 30. I then will destroy your high places, and cut down your incense altars, and heat the remains on the remains of your idols, for my soul will abhor you. This is strong language from the Lord. I will tear down your sanctuaries, tear down your altars, because if you, follow, you don't follow me and you begin to delight yourself in other things, my soul will abhor you. I will lay waste to your cities as well, and I will make your sanctuaries desolate, and I will not sm smell your soothing aroma. I will make the land desolate so your enemies will settle in it, and I be appalled over it. You, however, I will scatter among the nations, and I will draw the sword after you, and your land becomes desolate, and your cities become waste. If you know Israel's history, or you know history at all, you know that this happened several times in Israel. All right? I and mean, we know that Babylon is going to come and take Israel and, and the captivity for 70 years. We know that the temple is, is, is in ruins. The city walls are in ruins because Israel is in captivity. Yet they would come back and rebuild the temple in Nehemiah and rebuild the walls in Nehemiah. Yet we know this, that Jesus, 70, in 70 AD, Jesus predicted that Rome, Titus, the emperor, would come into Jerusalem and destroy the temple, destroy the city, and leave it in ruins. We looked at the pictures a couple weeks ago of Titus taking out the artifacts of the temple and taking them back to Rome on Titus's arch, that picture, that sculpture. And so we know that several times in Israel's history that their cities and their sanctuaries and their altars are laid in ruins. Even today, there is not an altar in Jerusalem. <laughs> There's nothing like that. There's not the Holy of Holies. There's nothing like that today because they've so disobeyed the Lord. Verse 24. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbath <laughs> all the days of desolation while you are in your enemy's land. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbath. I love that. It's kind of, I love the Lord say that. Because last week we looked at the, the year of Jubilee and the, the Sabbath rest. And we looked at how we're not a restful people, yet the Lord knows the land and the beast and people need rest. And so you are allowed to plant on your, your vineyards and plant on your plot for six years, but every seventh year that you are not to plant on your, on your ground so that your land might have rest. God knew that they were not going to keep this commandment, that they were going to overwork the land, overwork the people, overwork the livestock, and they were not going to enjoy the rest of the Lord and delight in the Lord. And I love that he says, then I will, the land will, when you're in slavery and when you're in captivity, the land will rest because no one will be there to work it anyway. All right? No one's going to be there to work it anyway. The land will have its rest. The beast will have its rest. And finally, my, 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 my statutes will be obeyed because somebody else has you in captivity. The land will have its rest. All the days of the desolation, it will deserve a rest which it did not observe on your Sabbath while you were living on it. So you are taking care of the land. The land was taken care of when you were in captivity. 
As for those of you who may be left, I love that. Man, that's a scary verse, right? And after I do all these horrible things to you for not keeping my commands and you delighting in other things, for those of you who are just left, I will also bring weakness into their hearts and the lands of your enemies, and the sound of a driven leaf will chase them. So Israel will be so scared, all right, that the leaves will fall off the trees and begin to chase the Israelites, the leaves are, and the Israelites will be so scared of leaves they will run. All right? That, you ever heard the, the, the term shaking like a leaf? All right? This is Israel right here, running from leaves. And even so, when no one is pursuing them, flee as though a leaf was a sword, and they will fall. And so we have all these things that are happening to Israel because they did not follow the commands of the Lord. And they hadn't even disobeyed God yet. God just knew their hearts. He knew everything about them. Remember the first week of Leviticus when we started talking about what's underneath Leviticus? What is God really doing throughout the whole Bible? What is God's motive in everything? And we looked at how God's motive was that he is for the sake of his glorious name. That the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And why does he do all these things? For his name's sake. His name, his glory, his renown is the most important thing. And that God is for God over and above being for us. And that is a wonderful thing. And so remember we talked about how when God was going to let them go into the promised land after 40 years of wandering in the desert, God reminded them, <laughs> you are not going in the promised land because your name is great. Because you're awesome and you've kept all my commands. <clears throat> You are going in the promised land, not because you are great. You are rebellious and stiff-necked people, and I should have killed you in the desert a long time ago. And if it weren't for Moses, I'd have done it. All right? He says, I'm taking you in the promised land because my name is great. My name is great. And so it's not about you. It's not about your covenant keeping that I'm great. My name is great. And so we look at the judgment of God and we think, what a... What a we, it's a bad rap, but God has to be just. Or sin and, and, and wrongness is never held into account. Listen to what the Bible says about judgment in Hebrews. I'm sorry, uh, Corinthians, chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the Lord in judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of you may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And so here's what we have, a picture of judgment here. That there is going to be a judgment day. And we've heard different things about what judgment day it, it entails for us. And so let me just break it down and we'll use some good doctrine here to do that. So that we are clear on what judgment day looks like for the Christian and what it looks like for the one who is not a Christian. Now here is the misnomer about judgment day. They're all going to go to heaven in the rapture and the world will be destroyed in Armageddon and God's going to call everybody together and He's going to call your name. And then a screen is going to come down. And a projector is going to project your life onto the screen. And God's going to get His laser pointer out. He's going to start pointing out all the sin in your life. Alright? David Hall, June 2nd, 1982. Remember that? Everybody's seeing it now. <laughs> Everybody's seeing it now. Alright? And then Ernest Calvin, alright? Uh, March 31st, 2005. Remember that? Remember that thought? And you're just embarrassed because everybody sees that thought. That is not what Judgment Day is. If you are a believer, your judgment was absorbed on the cross of Christ. When it says that you will be judged whether good or bad, as a believer, your bad was absorbed by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so what does the believer's judgment look like? Well, Revelation says this. The believers are in this throne room, and Jesus Christ is on the throne, uh, and, and there's a rainbow over the throne signifying grace, mercy, and that we begin to be judged for our deeds, for our good deeds, how we serve God. Because everything bad I've ever done was absorbed by Christ. My judgment, my evil thoughts, my bad covenant keeping, my everything about me when I was not acting right and being filled with the Spirit was absorbed by Christ. And it's this picture of just reward for the believer. And then the next picture is, I don't want this crown. I didn't earn this crown. And the crowns are being thrown at Jesus' feet because we did not earn right merit with God. We did not earn our good works. And that we were just throwing everything at Jesus' feet. 
This is for you, believer. So don't worry, believer, that a screen's going to come down and God's going to have his laser pointer out, okay? Your sins have been absorbed in the cross of Christ. There is no record of wrong in heaven against you. Your name is written in the land book of life, and that is the only thing written down. Now, there's another picture in Revelation. There's another judgment room for those who did not know Christ. And it is a scary telling, and I don't have time to read it right now, but we'll be doing Revelation pretty soon here. Is this. It's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And, it's, and they're not in a floor. It says, and the, and the earth gave up its dead, and the sea gave up its dead, and the grave gave up its dead, and Hades gave up its dead. And the Bible says that they were just kind of suspended in midair by the glory of God. And there's this great white throne, and there is no rainbow over this throne. There is no grace, there is no mercy, there is no love, there is no second chances in this room. And the Bible says the books were opened. And every man was judged, and every woman was judged according to what they had done on their own merits. And the truth is, you will never get to heaven on your own merits. Only if your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And no one in that great white throne room is going to heaven because your merits are not good enough. The first sin disqualifies you from heaven. But Christian, though our sins be many, and though we're still struggling to get it right, this is, the re this is why we rejoice in the cross. Because the blood of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ, the judgment of God on the cross absorbed my sin, and I am seen right, perfect, and good before the Father. And so that's what judgment looks like for us. And so, Alpha says, now I can approach the throne of grace with confidence because there's a better blood than the blood of Abel, that Christ is better than the sacrifices of goats and rams, that I can approach the throne of grace with confidence, not because I'm a good covenant keeper, but because He is. That everything that I, everything that I am, that, uh, Paul says, I am what I am by the grace of God. Man, what a gift. What a gift. This is why we come Sunday morning and rejoice that, that my sins are taken care of. My judgment is taken care of. Because I serve a loving God. And so let's look at our loving God. There's another if statement here in verse 40. If they confess their iniquity or their sins and the iniquity of their forefathers <coughs> in their unfaithfulness which they have committed against me and also in their acting with hostility against me, I also will act with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies or in their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they may make amends for their iniquity. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember my covenant with Isaac. And I will remember my covenant with Abraham as well. And remember the land. Man, I wish that I had time right now to go into the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a wonderful study. But he, is, he made this covenant a long time before Israel was slaves. He made this covenant a long time with a guy named Abraham, way back in Genesis chapter 12. He says, I will make your name great, Abraham. I will multiply your people, Abraham. And I will give you a son, and the whole world will be blessed through your offspring. And we know that Jesus Christ is part of Abraham's offspring. But here's what God says. That if you will turn from your sins and the sins of your forefathers, then I will remember my covenant. I remember the God of Jacob. I remember that I am the God of Isaac. I remember that I am the God of, of, of Jacob and Abraham. I remember all of those things if you just turn to me. So God is always getting us to turn. Turn. Listen to what he says here. They meanwhile will be making amends for their iniquity because they rejected my ordinances and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them. For I am the Lord your God. If you are, if you are a writer in your Bible, underline verse 45. I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors. Man, there is a great line there. And God says, even when you're in a desolate land, even when you're in bondage, even when you have not kept my covenant, even when you're in the middle of my judgment, I will remember my covenant for you. Even though you're not remembering my covenant, 
Even you're not remembering the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even though you're not going to remember what I did at Sinai. Even though you're not going to remember that I parted the Red Sea and the plagues of Egypt. Even though you're not going to remember that I brought you to the promised land. When you were under my judgment in Babylon and when you're feeling the sting of sin, I love you and I will remember for you my love for you. Even though you're not remembering it, even though you're not feeling it, know this, I'm remembering it and I'm remembering it for you. It says this, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt and the side of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. The Lord is constantly bringing us back to Him. So we look at Leviticus chapter 26, and we didn't get to read all of it and all the judgments, but the judgment is saying this, that, man, we're starting here slow, a little slow, a little light, so that you'll turn to me. But the longer you stay away from me, and the, and the longer that you turn your back on me, and the, and the longer you delight in other things and go seek other saviors, the worse judgment gets. But as bad as judgment gets, know this, I'm remembering for you the covenant that I made with you. And so Israel's history has been that they are horrible covenant keepers. Israel history has been that they've had all these prophets to point in their face going, you guys are horrible covenant keepers. But the history of Israel is this. God giving them chance after chance, always taking them back, always ready to be their father, always ready to be their God, always having a remnant of men or women who were so for God and always bringing the people back to God. This is what Leviticus has been about. So let me read the very last verse in Leviticus as we wrap up tonight. These are the commandments with the Lord, which the Lord commanded Moses for the sons of Israel at Mount Sinai. So these are the commands. And, and, and these, are, these are 27 chapters of just commands that God is giving Israel. And you know what the command is? Just summed up. Delight in me. This is the command of the whole Bible. From beginning to end, this is God's desire for us. We started off that God delights in himself and the glory of his name. And his wish for us is that we would delight in him. In fact, Psalm chapter 37, verse 4, is going to say, Delight in me, and I will give you the desires of your heart. That's a great verse. And so delight in the Lord is a command. We are commanded to carry out this, this order by God to figure out day by day by day how our foolish, sinful hearts might find delight in the Lord. And so we're called to just delight in Him. And so last week we looked at prayer and rest and what that looks like and how we create space in our life for just the Lord. Just the Lord. And so what is my invitation to you tonight? What I want us to think about is that you and I drift. You and I are chasers. The world is chasing other things. Now, we don't set up stones in our yard like Israel and kiss the stones and, and bow down before stones, but we don't have those kind of idols. We, we make idols, right, that we make down payments on. All right? And that, that we kind of pay off our idols. All right? That we have these other saviors. We have these other things that are stirring our affections. We're hope, we have these other things in our life that we're hoping will cause us to flourish. And the, and the word of Leviticus, and the word of God in Leviticus chapter 26 is this. Only delighting in me will cause blessing. Ultimate blessing and, and present blessing. Only delighting in me. And so I'll just leave you tonight with Psalm chapter 37 verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The next verse says, commit your way to him, and he will do it. That's the verse. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you so much for this day. We praise you, God, just for this, the gift Leviticus was to us. We thank you so much for from chapter 1 to chapter 27 that, that it is just filled with your goodness about what it looks like to delight in you, what, what it looks like to worship you, what it looks like to have you in the tent of meeting and calling us in. And we thank you so much that we are not just called into the Holy of Holies. That we're called as priests. And that we have a right, because of your Son, Jesus Christ, to be in the Holy of Holies and to perform our priestly duties. 
that we have a right to approach the throne of grace with confidence, not because of anything, anything that we have done, but because of everything that you have done. I thank you for our salvation, for those of us who trusted you and as Lord and Savior of our lives, that one day we will be rewarded for what we did in your name here on the earth, and that we will get crowns, but still feel unworthy to wear them and cast them at your feet because we don't deserve the merit or any reward. You deserve everything. And so, Lord, I pray right now for those maybe who have never trusted you as Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. They've never been sprinkled with your blood from, from head to toe. And that they're, they're, they're being judged right now on their deeds and maybe that they will not see a throne room with a rainbow. Father, I pray that they would trust you tonight as Lord and Savior of their lives. But I pray that you would help us to delight in you in all that we do. Lord, as we leave this place, and even as this prayer is done and this invitation is finished and as we walk out the door, that we would constantly be thinking, delighting in the Lord. That we would constantly be aware of our if statements. If I do this, there's blessing. If I do this, there's a curse. May we always live in the blessing. May we always live in your supply and your all-satisfying love. We ask all these things in your precious and holy name.